Amen. You may be seated today, and then you can go ahead and turn on in your Bibles. We're going to be looking in just a few minutes in Philippians chapter 4, so you can go ahead and turn there now. Philippians chapter 4. Change your thinking, change your life. Change your thinking, change your life. We've been in a four-part series, and what have we learned so far? First of all, we've learned that there is a battle going on. How many of you know there's a battle going on? Uh, there's battles going on in this world. There's a battle, a, a culture battle going on, a political battle going on uh, in our nation today. But there is a battle that is going on, and the battlefield is your mind. Everybody say, my mind. The battlefield is your, your mind. And we've been learning things about our thoughts, that our thoughts are powerful. Things like you can't have a positive life thinking negative thoughts. And if you can't change the way that you think, how can you then change the way that you live? Because our thoughts matter. What consumes your mind controls your life. What consumes your mind comes out and it, is, it controls your life. Now, in this series, we've been studying the, the life and the teaching of a man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament that we call the Apostle, the Apostle Paul. And in Philippians 4, go ahead and turn there now. In Philippians chapter 4, we're reading uh, what they call an epistle, which is just a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to his friends in the church in Philippi. And at the time that he is writing this letter, life is not good for the Apostle Paul. Paul's intention in his life and his ministry was to be a preacher in Rome, but instead he finds himself a prisoner in Rome instead of just being a preacher in, in Rome. So he's writing this letter from a Roman prison, and he pins this, this letter, which is a book of the Bible, the book of Philippians, which is known as the preeminent book of joy. Everybody say joy. I love the worship song that we were singing just a minute ago that said, I'll find the joy in every battle because why? Because I know that you are there. I know that's where you are. Here's Paul in the prison, and he writes the preeminent writing or book on joy in all of the Bible, and his theme of this book is that it doesn't matter what your circumstance, doesn't matter what you're going through, what the storm or what the battle that you're in or how bad life seems to be in your circumstances on the outside, that you can have joy. If you believe that, say amen today. But I want you to notice how he ends this letter talking about joy as he is encouraging this congregation. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Philippians 4 and verse 6, and we should have it on the PowerPoint this morning, but if we don't, that's okay. You can get it in your Bible today. Philippians 4 and 6, this is what the Apostle Paul says. Do not be anxious about anything. What's he saying there? Don't worry. He doesn't say be happy, but that comes along with it. But he says, don't worry about some things. Don't worry about too many things. Don't worry about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Verse 7, if you do that, then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, whatever you can imagine or understand, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your what? Your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus, verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is any excellent or praiseworthy thing about it, think on such things. He's telling you to make a choice. Choose what you think about, verse 9. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into, put into practice. The Bible calls our life of faith a walk of faith. Faith is something you live out. It is something that you practice. You know what we have today? We have too many lazy Christians. 
well, I don't like to study, and I'm not really good at prayer like other people are, and, and I'm not good at memorizing and, and all of that kind of stuff. Well, let me tell you what, if God gave you a brain and you can process information, he wants you to meditate on and study his word. He wants you to put into practice the word of God and the sermons and the teachings that are based on the word of God. If you believe that, say amen today. Don't just be a hearer of the word, Paul says, be a doer of the word. Put it into practice, and if you put it into practice, he says, the God of peace will be with you. Here's what Paul is saying, two very simple things. He says, don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. Boy, if we could just get that. If that's the only thing you can take away from this message today, that would be it right there. Don't worry about anything. How many believe that that's good to do? How many think that worry is bad? How many of you think that worry is a sin? How many of you have already worried today? I was talking to my wife outside of my office, and I was fixing to tell her, you know, I'm worried about this message today because I'm doing things a little bit different, and I thought, I better not say that because my message is about worry. That's a bad thing for me to worry before I preach on on worry. Listen, we all have trouble with that, and whether you believe it or not, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, but worry is a sin. We'll go there in a minute. Some of you are going, is it really that bad? Don't worry about anything, Paul says, but pray about everything. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to worry a lot. I don't know if you have a doctor or not, but I have a doctor, and he tells me that I have anxiety. And he tries to help me to understand, and he said, Todd, your anxiety is something that bypasses the logical part of your brain, and and, and it just causes your body to react, but you're not really thinking about that He says that I have anxiety, but even with or without my anxiety, I tend to worry a lot. How many of you tend to worry? Not not a whole lot of people going to raise your hand. We all worry. Say, Pastor Todd, what do you worry about? What it started when I was young. I was young and in the country of Haiti, and there are horrible diseases in the country of Haiti, like leprosy and all other kind of stuff like that. I remember being a child, I worried constantly that I was going to get leprosy. And so I would go outside and I would play a little bit and I'd come back inside and I would take a bath, take a shower. I wanted to wash it all off me. I didn't want to get get leprosy. As I started going along in school, I started worrying about school. I had adults tell me things like, you better get good grades. If you don't get good grades, you're never going to be anything in life and you won't be able to make a living. You won't be able to have a family or anything. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't understand this math. How am I going to live my life? I'm not going to have a life. Then I became a young adult man, and I began to see other people getting married, and I thought, God, will I ever get married? Will I ever find a woman good enough? No, I didn't think that at all. I just wanted to find somebody. Praise God. God sent along Sandra, and I met her, and two weeks later, I proposed. I'm like, listen, I'm going to get this while the getting is good right here, and I'm going to get married. Ah, But I was worried for a long time, will I ever find the right person to marry? And then we were going to wait five years to have kids, and two months into the marriage, Sandra comes to me with a big goofy smile on her face. And I learned later on what that smile means, but at that time I didn't know, and I'm like, honey, what is wrong with you? Do you eat something bad? And she's like, honey, I am pregnant. And I was happy for a little bit, and I thought, oh, my gosh, how are we going to afford all the diapers and all the formula and all the medical stuff that comes along with pregnancy? And then she had Jordan. He's sitting right over here. And I'll never forget the joy the day he was born. But the night, the very night after the day that he was born, I laid awake most of the night worrying about him. God, will something happen to him? I've heard about this SIDS thing where they just suddenly die in the crib. And, and, and will, he, will he eat right? Will he grow right? And, all, and I don't, will he have a good mind? And, and all these worries about him. And then she had, we had two more kids. She has nine brothers and sisters. And then when she told me about the third pregnancy, I wasn't real happy about that one. I thought, oh, my God. Now we're going to get four and five and six and seven and eight and nine And so praise the Lord, I put some legs to my prayers. I did something about that. I'm not going to get into any of that this morning, but (laughs) nip that in the bud right there. 
I remember her mother calling me on the phone crying, saying, Todd, this is not God's will. You ought to have as many uh, kids as God wants you to have. I said, I've already had all the kids God wants me to have. He told me with an audible voice, no more kids. Then I worried about those two kids. And on and on and on. How am I going to support my family? How, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? What if this happens? And then, then they, they get older and, and their education starts to become uh, an expensive thing. And, and then you worry about who they're going to marry. And then they get married and they have kids. And then you worry about the grandkids. And then all of a sudden now I find myself, I'm worrying about retirement. Where are we going to retire? And when are we going to retire? And how are we going to retire, afford to retire? And I don't know about you, but I tend to worry about all of these things. And it is so easy for our fearful, anxious thoughts to just run away from us and almost take control of us. And so in this series, this is what we've been talking about, the power of our thoughts. And here's been our theme for this series. Our lives are always going in the direction of our most powerful thoughts. Our lives are always going in the direction of our most powerful thoughts and that is good news if you think in good thoughts. That's good news if you're thinking positive, godly thoughts, thoughts that are, are, are uplifting God's truth and, and righteous things. But it's bad news if you're thinking fearful thoughts, anxious thoughts, negative thoughts, thoughts that produce anxiety in our lives, thoughts that produce nervous conditions that, that breed in our minds, that build over time and that create these negative pathways that we've been talking about and consume our minds with negativity and anxiety. And in this series, we've been talking about the human brain. Scientists used to think that once the, 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 the human being came to a physical maturity that the brain could still learn things but that physically chemically the brain had stopped growing but they found out uh, that there is such a thing as neuroplasticity that the adult brain all the way through to the end of life that the adult brain can physically change and morph over time if the right conditions are are present and one thing that scientists tell us about an interesting thing about our brains is that our brains, are, to some extent, are pre-programmed and they are pre-wired. And there's a lot of things that our brains wire to do uh, for us that are for our good and for our protection. And so uh, one of these things that our brain does is the pain stimulus. How many of you like pain? Nobody likes pain, but pain is good for you. Everybody say, pain is good for me. Yeah, you touch a hot stove and automatically your brain is going to cause your muscles to react and your hand and you go, oh my goodness. That is, that is how you didn't necessarily do that uh, with the front part of your brain, the thinking about that, but the fight or flight system in your brain began to kick in. And, and scientists tell us that we have this fight or flight part of our brain. It's a physical part of our brain. We don't have to necessarily think about it. That if, if usually if we hear a loud noise or we see something appear suddenly that is coming at us, our muscles will tense up because we're bracing. We're trying to protect ourselves. Sometimes our hands will fly up. Usually we will begin to vocalize or, or, or audibleize something that some people think is funny. How many of you have seen these videos on the Internet of people getting scared? You ever seen these? You need to look these up because it's funny. Sadistic people out there will actually try to scare you and they'll film you doing that. And one of those sadistic people is here today, right down here in the front row, it's my wife. She loves to scare people and get it on, on video. But I think we have a couple of videos, one she didn't do, someone else did, but a couple she did. If we can show these real quickly and you can see these this morning. Let's see if we can play that. That's all I'm telling you. <laughs> but I ain't saying win. <laughs> Boo! Oh. Okay. 
Sandra told me about that video of Pastor Walt. I said, Sandra, no wonder that man had to have a heart procedure. And that wasn't the only time she scared him or Amy. She scared both of them dozens and dozens of times. And, and those are funny, but what you're seeing there is you're seeing that, that part of our brain that is wired to protect us. It's wired for survival. That is our fight or flight um, response. And it's not, you don't have to think about it. It's not logical. Um, a, a part of us, it's, a, it's a, just a, a natural, uh, automatic response in our body. But, but God also gave us the prefrontal cortex or lobe of our brain that is logical, that can help us to overcome the flight or fight uh, response in, in our brain. Because if we're not careful, especially things that happen to us when, our young, when we're young, but sometimes when we're older... Things will happen to us in life that will trigger automatically that fight or flight response. But over time, we will build, let that build a pathway in our mind. And then things that are associated with whatever that event was will trigger that anxiety and that fear and that tensing up in our body even that goes along with that. And, and doctors tell us today that, that if, you, if you let that fight or flight thing continually be in your life as you worry about finances or you worry about medical problems or you worry about your family or your job or whatever it is that you're worrying about, that you, you can tense your body. It will create all kind of problems in your body. You can develop nervous conditions, and it can even, they say it can develop cancer in your body and all kind of ulcers and all other kind of, of horrible things. But I had something like this happen to me. In fact, I had a lot of things happen to me when I was young like that, I guess. That's why I have an anxiety disorder. But one thing was when I was about four or five years old, I was hanging upside down, I think, on a garage door. Is that what it was? So here's my parents right down here that were not watching their four-year-old. They let him climb up and hang upside down. And, and anyway, my, my legs gave way, and I went right down on my face, and I split my upper lip open. And I can remember this to this day. They took me to a Haitian, a good Haitian hospital, to a good Haitian doctor, and, and he started sewing my lip up, and I was screaming the whole time this doctor is sewing my lip up. And I think dad or somebody said, didn't he give you anything for the pain? I said, I don't know, but I didn't feel if he numbed anything. I felt all of the pain. And now, even as an adult today, I can go to a medical facility, a doctor's office, and they can just be, they're not even sticking me with anything. They're just taking my blood pressure. And they put the blood pressure cuff on me. I will tense up every, every muscle in my body. I will stop breathing, and the medical professional has to say, Todd, you need to breathe. Usually they call me Jeff because that's my name written on there, Jeff. But anyway, they'll say, Jeff, you need to breathe. Relax. You need to, you're going to pass out, son. And sometimes I do almost pass out, but I have this, I guess they call it a white coat syndrome. Uh, but anyway, there's something in my mind, a pathway there that has developed over time that says doctors are dangerous. And the nurses that come with them, and you better look at and that fight or flight thing takes over. And so what I have to do now, by, by learning, I have to activate my prefrontal cortex, the logical part of my brain. And when I go into the doctor's office, I have to say, doctors are good. The doctor is here to help me today. He's not here to hurt me. Uh, this blood pressure curf, cuff is not going to hurt my body at all. I'm going to relax every muscle I go through. And I start hearing my shoulders and go all the way down, my legs. And I'm relaxing all muscles. And I have to say every 10 seconds or so, breathe. Take a breath in, take a breath out. Just relax. Nobody's here to hurt you. And let me tell you what, that's a funny story right there, but there's a lot of us that we live our lives like that. And there are these little triggers in our life. And it could be a financial trigger or uh, an argument or a relationship trigger, and it triggers that fight or flight thing in us, and we go around all day long with that fight or flight response in us, tensing up our muscles, and it creates headaches and, and all kind of problems, and we live these lives of anxiousness, fearfulness with excessive worry and anxiety in our lives. And let me tell you what, this is not a good thing. Everybody say it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Jesus did not tell us, let your heart be troubled. He said, let not your heart be troubled. 
Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus also said, don't worry about anything. In fact, he said that over and over and over again. Don't worry about anything. At at Jesus' birth, the angels did not show up and say, glory to God, stress, anxiety, and fear on earth. They didn't say that at all. They said glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And the apostle Paul in verse 6 of Philippians 4, he did not say be anxious about everything. He said just the opposite. Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. Don't worry about anything But pray about everything. And then in verse 7, he says, and the peace of God. If you don't worry about anything, if you pray about everything, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Here's what Paul is saying. We're talking about these pathways in our minds. Paul is saying that the pathway to peace is prayer. Isn't that simple? If you need peace in your life, if you've been suffering with anxiety and with worry and hypertension and all of that stuff, the pathway to peace in your life is prayer. And here's the problem for a lot of us today. For whatever reason, for too many of us today, prayer is usually our last resort. We even have a saying today, at least in America, well, I guess the only thing we can do now is Pray. What does that mean? That means we've tried everything else, and now the only thing we have left, a Hail Mary, literally, all we can do now is pray. Let me tell you something. Paul is telling us today that prayer should never be a last resort. Prayer should always be our front line of offense. Somebody say amen today. Why is that? Because we have the power and authority and the privilege to have an audience at any time that we choose with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, with the Creator of the universe today, we can have an audience with Him and we can tell Him all about it. Somebody say praise the Lord. And He says if you ask anything according to my will, in my name, God hears your prayers. And you have not because you... That's not, woe is me, why am I going through this and all this trouble in my life? You have not because you ask not. The Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all what? That we ask or even think by the power of prayer and the Holy Spirit that works within, within us. So I've got good news for you today. Number one, good news is that God or prayer moves God. Everybody say that with me. Prayer moves God. God is a responsive agent. What does he respond to? He responds to the prayer of faith. Prayer moves God, but it does not end there. Prayer moves God, but also, and probably just as importantly, if not more importantly, than prayer moving God, is that prayer changes you. Prayer moves God. It does something in heaven But it also changes me. Again, we've been talking about the human brain. And we've been talking about neuroplasticity, that our brain is not done changing just because we're adults or even because we are older, that by thinking new thoughts we can create new pathways in our brain and change the chemistry of our brain. But there is also, this is medical science. Everybody say it's science. You don't believe me? You can look it up. But not only is there a such thing or a science called neuroplasticity, there is a science called neurotheology. And that's not something that's just in the seminaries. Theology is the study of God, but there is a a scientific uh, arena where they've actually done all kind of studies and they have compiled uh, results and uh, and people have written theses on this, and it is called neurotheology. And this is what neurotheology says. It talks about the physical effects of prayer on the human brain. 
Now, we're not talking about emotional effects. I feel better or I'm happier or I'm more joyful when I pray. We're talking about physical effects in the human brain because of prayer. And this is what they have found in these studies. They have found that prayer changes the chemistry of your brain. Now, I'm not just looking at this in Christian books or on Christian websites. There was an article on NPR, National Public Radio, and they're not exactly pro-God or pro-Christian, but they did a whole series of articles on neurotheology, that prayer changes the chemistry of the human brain. And here's the scientific finding. Twelve minutes of prayer a day over a period of eight weeks changes the human brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Prayer moves God and prayer changes me. Somebody say praise the Lord. That's why the Apostle Paul said don't conform to the patterns of thinking of this world but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may not believe it. You may have given up on it. But I'm telling you today by God's word, God wants to do a healing work in your mind. You say, I'm going through all these battles, all these struggles in my life. Listen, it begins and it ends in your mind today with your thoughts. That's why Paul says you need a mind that is renewed. How? By God's truth, by meditating on God's truth, memorizing Scripture, studying God's Word. You're training your mind towards truth. But not only that, by the power of the Holy Spirit, which exists right here in God's Word, but also through the pathway of prayer. Everybody say prayer. The devil will fight you in prayer. He will fight you to the death just over your prayer life because he knows the potential of prayer in your life. He knows what prayer can do, that it can even physically change your mind and create new pathways in, in, your, in your mind. Now, we talked about worry earlier, and I said that worry is sin. And I want to tell you something today. It's true. Worry is sin. Say, Pastor, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that worry is, is sin. The Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What is worry? Worry, if you want to boil it down, is doubt. If I'm worrying about something, usually it's about something in the future that hadn't even happened yet. That probably isn't going to happen anyway. But I'm worried about what am I saying? I'm doubting that God's going to bring me through that safely. I'm doubting the power of God and the hand of God. And the Bible says that worry is sin. Look with me in Romans chapter 8, 5, and 6. And I'm fixing to close. Romans 8, 5, and 6. This is what Paul says. He says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Verse 6. So letting your sinful nature controlling your, control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and what? It leads to life and peace. And here's what we've got to learn how to do. We've got to learn to, have that, to, to allow that thinking part of our mind to make a choice. And we've got to choose. I'm not going to let the lies of the devil torment me. I'm not going to let the worries and the fears of my life and my sinful nature control my mind. Say, Pastor Todd, that sounds good, but how, how do we actually do that? What do you do in a moment of fear, in a moment of worry, and in a moment of anxiety? I'm going to show you this little illustration here real quick if I can. This little box here represents your life. Everybody say, that's my life. Now, all of us, none of us are exempt from worry. All of us in our life, we also have a little box inside of us of worries. We've got that little box of worries right there with all of our worries inside of it. This is the worries, I guess. But hopefully, if we're a Christian, what else do we have in there? we got God in there. Isn't he cute? We got God in there. Now, here's what we need to learn to do. We need to choose and make a choice. This is what Paul is saying. 
Paul says, you're not left at the mercy of these thoughts coming in your head. You have a choice to make. You can choose the thoughts that you allow to stay in what you meditate on. And Paul says, you need to choose to take these worries. And you need to take these worries and you need to give them to God. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Give them to God. So we do that. God, I give you these worries. And then somewhere, usually in the middle of the night, thoughts start running crazy. When you say, you know what, God? I love you, and I'm glad that you're here, but I'm going to take some of these worries back. Why would we ever do that? Once you give it to God, you make that choice to give it to God, why would you ever take it back? But that's exactly what we do. Let me tell you why we do that. Why we do that is because if we keep taking all these worries, we got a problem. Anybody see the problem that I see here? What's the problem? Somebody say it. Your God is too small. Your God is too small for the worries that are in your life. But here you are now with your little tiny God and all your worries in there and it's just spilling all out. There's only one thing left for you to do. And that's right here. Come on, somebody give God a praise. (laughs) You need a bigger God. Now there's a problem with this bigger God. He doesn't fit in your life. Anybody see that? And that's the problem that a lot of people have. That bigger God, he wants to control everything. He doesn't fit in my life. That's why we have the little God. But we need a bigger God if we want to make it through this thing. We get that bigger God. Everything else, everything else will fit inside that bigger God. Let me tell you what this bigger God said that exists out there in the universe somewhere. He said, I love mankind so much and they need me. And so this bigger God that fills the universe, he said, I'm going to come to earth. And he came in the form of Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, any man who is in me, all things are passed away and behold, all things are new. But you got to take everything your whole life here. And you got to put it in Christ Jesus. And you got to say, Jesus, I trust you once and for all. And I'm giving up control. And I'm putting my life inside of you. I'm surrendering in you. This is what the new birth is all about. Some people think that being born again is just believing on Christ. You know that the devils even believe on Jesus. But they're not doing this. The new birth is symbolized in water baptism, which means you take your whole life die to yourself and you put your whole life in Christ Jesus and say God I'm yours I'm yours all my worries all my fears all my anxieties all my problems all my battles all my storms God I give it all to you it belongs to you and let me tell you what if your God is big enough it'll all fit down inside there nicely and you can trust God with it everybody stand on your feet with me this morning hallelujah Glory to God. This is what this series is all about today. About saying, God, I give it up to you. God, I want you to renew my mind today. Now, you might have said, Pastor Todd, I've tried that once and it didn't work. It's not about trying it once. Remember, faith is a walk. It's a walk every day. The Bible says, there's a scripture that says, as your days are, so shall your strength be. God gives us enough strength to walk every day. Let me tell you what, walk takes effort. The Bible says to study, studying takes effort. It says to meditate, meditate. Meditating on God's Word takes effort. The Bible tells us all kinds of things to do. Some people say, well, I don't like the Bible because it tells me to do this and do that and do that. And, and, and I don't want to be under legalism. Listen, all that stuff in God's Word that it tells you to do is not about legalism. It's about protection. It's God saying, I want to protect you. And so we follow God and we walk after God and we do the things that he says to do. We stay away from the things he says not to do. And then he protects us. And he says, if you do that, I will renew your 
mind. But you got to train your mind towards truth. Let the logical part of your brain make a choice and choose every single day. You need to wake up every single day. God, I give you my mind. I give you my worries. I give you my fears. There's some people in here today, you be honest, don't raise your hand this morning, but I'm worrying about my own weakness. I keep giving in to the same thing that I know I'm not supposed to be doing over and over and over again. And the Apostle Paul went through all that, and he said, who can deliver me from this? He said, Jesus Christ, my Lord. You've got to surrender to him every day. God, I surrender to you every day. Every day. He'll give you the strength to walk through. God wants to give people healing today. You might every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. He wants to heal you from worry. There are people in this room almost every day, all day long, your thoughts are consumed with fears and anxieties and worries. You need to rest in Jesus Christ today and make a choice. God, I allow you to renew my mind. God, I'm going to get in your word today. I'm going to train my mind towards truth. God, I'm going to begin the day praying. I'm going to pray in my lunch hour and break. God, I'm going to pray the last thing I do before I go to sleep at night. God, I'm going to pray. And God says, if you pray and refuse to worry, the peace of God that passes all understanding will overshadow your life. Hallelujah. Somebody give God.